Hello, Slush. Um, the topic we are going to be discussing now is building world-class consumer products. And with me on stage is Rasanne from IVP, uh, Antoine from Felix Capital, and Toby from High Studios, who's actually building a fantastic <laughs> consumer product right now. Um, my name is Jenny. I'm from BackVC, and I also run an Instagram account called Think Testing. Um, I want to invite you all to ask questions from each other as well, but I thought I could kick us off. Um, there's a lot of interesting things happening in consumer right now. Everything from personalization, new experiences, new um, channels, and a massive amount of exciting new brands. Um, my first question to the investors on the panel, Rosanne, maybe you can start, uh, is what trend in consumer tech are you most excited about right now? So I feel like there's a lot of really interesting things happening in consumer at the moment. One thing that we're seeing a lot of in the US is kind of these direct-to-consumer brands kind of jumping from kind of like pure play over the counter into actually like uh, pharmaceutical products. So for instance, we're investors in Hims. There's also Roman and Keeps uh, in the US that have actually gone to market with uh, men's health products like Rogaine and Viagra and Cialis. So I think it's really interesting that we're actually seeing like dedicated real brands that are direct to consumer but actually operating in regulated industries. Uh, another thing we were talking about backstage is we're seeing a lot of like cannabis and CBD kind of entering into the mainstream as it becomes more and more um, legal in the US. And I think that funds are trying to figure out what to do with that, but we're seeing just so much consumer pull. What about Felix Capital? Is cannabis something on the table? No, it's a similar thought that one Rosanne uh, just mentioned. I think the, what's interesting today is to, to see that these new emerging trends that could be considered as taboo or niche uh, in the future, uh, in the past, sorry, which are now emerging as very, very big market and very big opportunity. And often uh, these trends are emerging from a younger population, which used not to be the case, actually. But now you have a younger population that doesn't think it's taboo to, to talk about hair loss or <laughs> to talk about sex toys or to talk about cannabis. And these are becoming a very big niche. Um, and I would add to this that the, what's interesting in these new trends is also is how you go to market uh, in the sense that we're coming out from a cycle where uh, Digital was a way to go and was mainstream. And now what we're looking at when we look at opportunities, actually entrepreneurs that can manage the, both worlds, so the online and the offline side uh, very well. And it's more about finding your customers in the most efficient way in every specific market. For sure, yeah. Let's talk more about the offline side with Glossier later. Uh, I wanted to hear one trend I really love and I've seen a lot about is direct-to-consumer. And obviously, um, Toby, I'd love to hear what you saw uh, the opportunity was when you wanted to start Heist and the kind of backstory of how, how everything got started. Yeah, I mean, I think... Well, firstly, I think the trend that we're seeing that's interesting is um, something we saw ages ago, we foresaw, but it's the collapse of Facebook marketing. And I think what that means is that ever more so this idea of direct-to-consumer is a bit of a misnomer, because the last five years you could put, whatever, a commodity mattress in a box and arbitrage Facebook advert, and you can't anymore. So we've actually seen a change which is, I think, really fundamental that underscores our position, which is that Consumers haven't changed just because the internet popped up. Essentially, people buy extraordinary products from brands they connect with on an emotional and political level. And I think what's interesting when we start talking about community and different ways of going to market, what we're really saying is the easy days of just being able to use a Shopify website to flog something are over, and we're back to brand building. And it's actually no different building heist to the challenges building Armani. And I think we've got to stop talking about direct-to-consumer because like, the most direct-to-consumer was the Victorian grocer who <laughs> knew how many sausages you wanted. Right? Like, that was direct-to-consumer. Right. And the idea that we have more data on our customers and them is, is like nonsensical. But so uh, the backstory for heist is, is I mean, naturally, um, well, it's a bit of a weird shift because uh, my first business was in solar energy. And we were lucky enough to sell that to IKEA. So you can walk into an IKEA and buy a solar system like you can buy a kitchen. Um, and 
uh, I stupidly had founded it with another guy called Toby, the only other Toby I know. And so we did a lot of PR, like self-aggrandizing shit about two Tobys saving the world, etc. And the more when you just strip all of that out, you realize that actually you're building a consumer brand. And I was at Bain for five years, and if anybody here is a management consultant, the one thing you learn is that management consultancy does not tell you, teach you how to set up a consumer brand. Um, and we became fascinated, though, by our time in IKEA, because you start measuring brands not on a level of, like, can 20% of our audience hear about us, but 800 million people a year walk through the doors of that store. It owns its category across 45 geographies. And so we started high with a challenge of, like, how do you create a brand that can positively change a category? Um, and, and we did that, weirdly, um, I ended up in women's underwear because it has these two things which are fascinating. On a brand side, it's like Dallas in the 1980s. Like the most, one of the most important themes we're dealing with is women in society. And I, like, obviously, I would never lecture anybody on that. Um, but this is, this is, you know, you've only got to look at Brett Kavanaugh proceedings, whereas this is a dominant social problem and theme. And then the other is that there's a total lack of innovation. And if you have this where the brands are outdated and the products don't innovate, you have this amazing opportunity as a consumer brand to build something that's really different. So what we do is we use really deep technology to reinvent basic products. So we use laser perforated industrial membranes to create a Spanx variant, but instead of compressing all of you, it just compresses in a non-linear way certain parts of you. So essentially it's Spanx, but feels really comfortable. Um, but from our point, we just see we're back to the age old thing of trying to build products that are better than Got what it. exists. Uh, I, the next question I really wanted to you touch upon it already is this aspect of building brands because it seems that in a, in a world with, with these companies uh, there's the most defensible part of them is the communities, the movements and the brands that they're building. You mentioned quickly, can we quickly go back to how did you identify what the story would be as I guess two guys building products for, for women? Uh, how, how, did you, how did you go about that and identifying what, what the story would be that would catch upon and build the, the movement around underwear? Like with difficulty, I mean, like I clearly don't wear underwear, and I don't know much about women. And if you add those together, it was a pretty <laughs> shitty place to start. Um, I think we had this clear vision um, that that product innovation could unlock a much better wearing experience. Um, and then I think we built the brands over time. And I know that sounds like everybody wants you to be perfect on day one, but in reality. I didn't know a huge amount about polymer physics until the last years. We w we're now using lasers to help us redesign bras. And I had no idea how you could do that two years ago. So you kind of evolve into your mission a bit. Um, and we actually started with the most banal, boring product, which was take a pair of tights. Like, can you use technology to reinvent a pair of tights? And you know, that was our, br our initial brand was kind of helping us do that. Sure, yeah. Um, Antoine, you have a, a super interesting portfolio with a lot of companies that have a kind of a content-driven strategy behind them. Goop and um, High Snobiety. Did I say it right? High Snobiety. 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 Oh, High Snob. Uh, business of fashion, etc. Um, how? What is it in these models that you that you spot and, and see and, and want to invest in? It's, it's funny because um, Actually, I think we had an unfair advantage to, to back these companies because these three companies you mentioned, uh, being Goo, BOF, or Icenob, are, are companies that were built 10 years before when we invested in the company. So during this time, they had really the opportunity to build this community in a very authentic way uh, with no money raised from any venture capital money or any other source of money. So these guys, when they started the business, didn't know that they will be trying to build a very scalable and very big business. They were just doing something they were extremely passionate about. So being uh, Gwyneth talking about women uh, lifestyle or, or Imran talking about the world of fashion or, or David talking about sneakers or, or streetwear stuff that he was passionate about uh, during university. So the situation here is us as being quite focused and thematic. When we saw this company that we just as users were loving it, we reached out and we were at the stage, these entrepreneurs were at the stage in their path, in their journey where they actually stumbled onto something that could be much bigger and they were now looking for support to help them get into the next phase. 
So when you think about Goop, what's about starting to be more transactional, start selling their own branded product rather than third-party product. Uh, when it's about BOF, it's about to start leveraging this uh, customer base by issuing premium content or, or, or classes around fashion world. And uh, with Ice Novariety, we, what we aim to do uh, next year is to launch a more transactional site to, to the website to, to, to leverage this very strong appetite around sneakers and streetwear. So I think the challenge today, though, is uh, looking at companies that don't have these eight or 10 years of, uh, of community and that manage in six months or a year or, or a couple of years to build a strong community, a strong emotional relationship with the customers. And that's hard to do today. What, what is it that you have to find in those companies then? Is it uh, if, if there isn't the content or engagement? It's, on that it's what we call uh, customer love. So it's uh, it can be so it it can be for content. Uh, so it will be the engagement around content, but it's about uh, loving the product and uh, on the entrepreneur side, being obsessed about customers loving your product and being in these early days where you don't have money, you can't spend money, splash money on Facebook or Instagram or other source. You don't need to have a lot of customers. What you need is to have very engaged customers that repeat, where there's a word of mouth. And this is crafted. This is maybe the, the, the women selling the sausage to their customer every day that know exactly what they want to buy. But it's exactly the same thing. It's, uh, it's, not, you know, it's nothing related to the digital space per se, but it's this obsession of your having happy customers. Mm. Mm. Um, I have a lot of customer love for <laughs> one of your portfolio companies, Rosanne, uh, Glossier. Uh, and I thought maybe we could talk about the brand building story there as well, and, and especially in the later stage where you, you invested in the B and C round, if yeah, I'm correct. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, let's go ahead. I mean, I think there's, there's so much in common with what you're talking about. I, I mean, I think customer love is really at the core of all of these consumer businesses. And frankly, there are some direct, like some consumer businesses that are not good matches for the venture capital model. And I think that's because you end up spending a lot of dollars on promotions and discounting to try to kind of speed up the, the customer life cycle and you never actually build that love and that's what's actually valuable in these businesses. And frankly, it's also distribution to like what you guys were saying about channels. And yeah, like Facebook is gonna have way more data on the traffic that you buy from them than you do. And so you have to do other things. And so, and offline, I guess. Now, and it, yeah. offline as well. And you know, I think, um, you know, it's funny because people ask a lot about Glossier, like, because it seems like this overnight success, but it was like an overnight success, like eight years in the making, because. Emily started into the gloss, like the the blog, um, about eight years ago, and she like it was a part time job, like it was her side hustle. She woke up at like four in the morning and posted for a couple hours, and then went to work, and then turned that into a business. Kirsten Green from Forerunner funded that, and then she uh, lay layered the brand on top of it. But you know, those first four years of the business, she was learning a ton about her customers, a ton about the market, what they actually wanted, and what. Uh, you know, what, what they weren't getting. And, you know, I, I think that that kind of love and community from the beginning is the foundation upon which everything else is built. And, you know, lately the business has been going more and more offline because, you know, frankly, I think that digital marketing is overpriced, right? Like, I think people are willing to play a premium for it because you can track it. But that doesn't mean that it's actually more valuable than a store or out of home or television. Like we see a lot of brands actually doing remnant TV in a very cost effective way. But I think about like real estate as CAC, right? Like um, Glossier has two permanent stores. Uh, they just opened a brand new New York flagship that's amazing. If you're in New York, you have to go see it. It's like the stairway to heaven. It's like the museum of Glossier. And then they also have a store on Melrose Place in LA. Um, but they did this pop up in San Francisco that was incredible and they like, you know, covered the city for a month, and that activation is really valuable, and and it's actually way more impactful and way less noisy, and frankly, like way less competitive than if you tried to you know plaster Instagram with your ads. I also think that Glossier was really lucky in that they kind of came of age in a period where you could actually build a brand on Instagram. I I frankly think that that time is over, right? Like Instagram used to be a chronological feed. Now it's an algorithmic feed and how often you show up, even in your organic followers, is completely dependent on how much you pay. And so you just can't break out that way anymore. You really have to be thinking about different channels that you have leverage and control over. Yeah. You also opened a store in, in London recently, right? What was the, the offline uh, thinking that you, that you wanted to reach uh, I, through the store? On listen, I think we did what everybody else did, which is, you know, I mean, I don't use Instagram, I don't use Facebook. Our customers 
do, but for some time of the day. And you want to be able to, to reach them in different cost-effective ways. And you want to also give them a different way of experiencing the brand. And I think we saw it was like the most valuable thing we've done. Um, and it, it also just gets you, this, this thing about data is always an interesting one. Because off, online, you actually you don't have that much data. Sure, you can look at gender, and you can look at you know, the various like quite deep segmentation tools that Facebook offer you. But you don't have that opportunity to talk to someone. And I think that's just an amazing thing for us. It's like I, mean, I stand in the shop, and I talk to customers, and I'm kind of learning a lot from it. So it's been like a, a, really, a really interesting thing. And the question we have is, how do you scale that, and what are the models, and how do you make that work? You can see people at Warby called it really early, and they went into they called demise of Facebook very early. They went into retail really hard, and that seems to be a model that's working. And then the other model that's working is something like Glossier, where it's you know, two stores is a really small number of shops for such a big brand, and they've done experiential pop-ups really powerfully. And so now we're all kind of grappling back with the questions that people had 50 years ago of like, how do you build a brand through retail? Um, and, and that's you know that's interesting. I don't think we've figured out clean answers. I don't know if your portfolio has. Totally. I mean, I think a lot about like the death of malls in America, right? Like, actually, the town I grew up in, there's one of these malls that was like one of the very first malls, and now it's like a wasteland. And some photographer went in and took these like horrible post-apocalyptic pictures of it. And frankly, I think it's because malls were optimized for supply, right? Like, you can have a ton of stores. They all look the same. It's very easy to deliver inventory to them. You can have this, like, very scalable experience, but it's, it's shit for the customer, right? Like, it's not special. It's not experiential. Like, it's the same everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're in Cleveland, Ohio, or, you know, in San Francisco. Like, it's the mall is the mall. And, and, and also, can I, th there's yeah. a fundamental thing about retail, which is there is a finite number of shops on a high street or in a mall. Right. So you optimize to get the highest percentage of footfall, like tacitly or thing. Right. And the problem we face, the problem those brands face, and the reason why like, all of those Arcadia brands are collapsing is because optimizing for the middle doesn't work in a noisy, digital-driven environment. Right. So that intersection of retail and, and online is causing havoc. Totally. And I think also like with modern retail, you want it to be unique, right? Like you want it to go be somewhere where like somebody is, makes the trek to go there. They go, they take pictures on social media, they get super excited about it. And you can't like you that does not scale, right? Like specialness like that, you can't have, you know, 500 doors that all look the same. And you can't expect them to do it every Saturday either. Right. I'll ask you quickly, Toby, a question before. I want to cover also the difference between brands built in Europe and US. But before that, a question on an essential part of building a consumer tech product, which is funding. Um, how should uh, a founder here in the audience think about funding in this space? What should they uh, look for in their investors? Uh, well, so we are just beginning a funding round now. So I am like clouded by that feeling of self-hate that begins <laughs> any investment process. Um, uh, listen, I think that we've, obviously, all companies are different and all environments are different. I think the thing that we're very keen on is just trying to invert this ridiculous asymmetry where, you know, you guys have money, so we're nice to you once every 12 months. And you send, you know, people, want, people come to us and say, this is our process. It's two meetings, then a yes or no. And you're like, well, you know what, actually, Screw you. <laughs> like, what, how are you going to do it? What about my yes or no? And so we've actually inverted it. All these investors, there's a very typical thing of saying, you know, we like to help. And I don't think that in two meetings where I tell you about the business, I can know whether you can help. So we've done, we've tried, we flip, flipping this round and we've just done it and saying, this is the process. I don't care that you went to Oxford and then Morgan Stanley. Like, I want to know what do you know about consumer brands and how do you think about the challenges we're facing? And it's been fascinating. Like, we've seen some VCs like throw themselves at the process and a bunch of them just be like, I'm really sorry. That's not how we, we that's not how we do time management on our way. But I think for any founders out there, the single question is, capital's a real commodity, um, but if you can, and there's now enough money out there that if you've got a good business, it will get funded. But the real question is, how do you work out whether the people on the other side of the table, um, like both figuratively and literally, um, can help you with the myriad of challenges? Because like, Heist is a two-year-old business, right? I mean, we have so much that we don't know and don't understand. Um, but trying to work that out, the, the current model 
doesn't allow for founders to get to know VCs very well. And I think it's like the biggest issue with the in industry because it shouldn't be an asymmetric relationship. Economically, it's a really symmetric one and we both need each other, we both prosper from each other. Um, but it's, and I think the US guys are much better at being open to that stuff than European funds. Well, Antoine. That's, that's a nice <laughs> transition. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you, you're right that, uh, I mean, talking about Europe and US uh, and talking about brands in Europe and US, uh, there's, there's two things to think about is how the investors behave in these different markets and and how easy or not it is to scale a business in Europe versus US. Um, we launch our business, we, we launch our brand, our platform, Felix, is out of Europe because as a lifestyle focused fund, we do genuinely believe that a lot of the themes we're going after, uh, if you think about food, about travel, about wellness, are themes where Europe has an older heritage in this and has a older DNA than the US. And Hence, you have entrepreneurs that can emerge out of these categories with uh, um, maybe a more passionate eyes around product, around how, around customer, or consumers. Talent, basically. Yeah, uh, about how to reach out to consumers, how to have this kind of perfect product. It's maybe us being a bit idealist about this, but we do genuinely believe about that. After you have to be realistic about our world of venture capital, the dark force, and so on, but. If you want to scale fast, you don't have the same magic that you have in Europe, but you have in the US. And also, it's fair to say that our US colleagues has a more, have a more uh, bold approach and also more capital in order to do bets that in Europe is more difficult to do. I mean, if you take HIMSS as an example, um, HIMSS is a company that from scratch was fueled with a lot, a lot, a lot of capital to build a category which was unproven. It was kind of new market that, listen, uh, we don't talk about air loss so far, we don't talk about erectile dysfunction, but actually we're now going to start talking about it and we're going to put it in your face and it's not going to become taboo and everything's going to be fine. And it is the right thing to do for, for sure, but I have to say that it would be much more difficult for Hims to come out of Europe with so much capital and be able to scale that fast in a year's time with the support of great funds around saying, listen, we're going to put 100 million and you're going to make it happen. Um, this is a challenge we have today. I think the, the, the talent and the quality is there and the, 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 the relevancy with uh, disrupting traditional lifestyle segments, but we're not there yet in terms of uh, the beauty of a U.S. market and the U.S. demographic and the boldness of uh, the U.S. investors. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, to both of your points, right, like, in the U.S., there's so much, there's so many venture dollars, and they are commodities, right? Like, there's so much money, and, like, frankly, like, good companies are the rare, like, are, are the rare asset, and, and so I think that that also fuels a lot of behavior, right? Like, I, I think that the idea, you know, Hims is going after a massive category, and, there's a telehealth business that's the foundation of it, and that TAM is so large, and everybody's funds are so big, they're willing to put big dollars behind something that can be really, really big. And so I think, yeah, you see that boldness and risk-taking, and a lot of it comes from the financing environment. Yeah. How is it then, uh, do you have the same take on talent and the heritage brand in Europe, as Antoine mentioned, and are you looking to invest in, in, in Europe for this reason? Yeah, um, I spend a good amount of time in Europe. I haven't made any brand investments. We haven't made any brand investments yet. Um, but I, I completely agree with you when it comes to, I mean, I was just thinking about this as you're saying it, like most of the things I'm wearing are European brands, right? Like um, I think from kind of like a positioning and quality point of view, it's really spot on. And, and I, I, frankly, I think we're going to see more and more of it. It's more of a longevity play because I think that, you know, the U.S. is also like, especially the West Coast, our proximity to China, we're very good at getting cheap stuff in off the, uh, you know, over the Pacific and selling that, but that's not how you create customer love, right? That doesn't endure. Um, so I'm excited to see kind of what comes out of Europe, but I think it's just people going after big, bold bets is why we're seeing so much out of the US. And I don't think you can discount the single media market that reaches, like there's so much luck, and not luck, there's so many great brands who do great things, but whatever, you know, you've just seen the businesses build on the back of almost fast company articles. Whereas we've got the same market, but there are 27 countries and 27 media markets, 27 languages. And it, you know, it, it, it means that you, know, you don't get those huge PR boosts in the way that you can do in the States. 
Um, and definitely for early traction makes What's a big difference. What's your take on, on US or internal internationalization overall? No, I mean, I think we're all seeing the same. I think obviously Brexit is uh, a bit of a curveball um, on both societal and business levels. But I think, you know, we recognize that, you know, whilst, for example, we've got a really thriving German business, but there isn't a German VC pool out there. So we're like every brand, we're, we're, we're looking at, we have to crack the US and that has to be our next move. Um, and, you know, on many levels, we'd try and do France or Germany first because all the, actually Nordics where we, ha we have quite a good penetration. But you just can't make that play. You're, every penny has to go into cracking the US. I know, actually, I think it's really interesting. Like, uh, I have a friend in uh, General, or General Atlantic's retail group, and she's done a lot of brands like Cezanne and uh, Joe and the Juice that have now come to the US. And uh, I mean, obviously, Joe and the Juice is retail, but Cezanne has a US store. But we're really kind of like seeing these brands skip over, but it's, it's private equity fueled, not, not venture fueled. And it's interesting when people like, like Allbirds, who's a brand I think is amazing, and they've done an incredible job. But it's interesting watching them open like UK stores mm. and seeing whether that huge halo of PR and noise that drives these ridiculous retail experiences in New York where you like you fight to get a pair of shoes. Yeah. It's interesting as they take the first steps to move into European markets, whether that translates the same way, because we're all having to do it the other way around, so it's you know, um, uh, you know, it's it's kind of fascinating. We're beginning to become properly international brands. Yeah, I mean one of, uh, I don't know if it's a sad thing or not, but out of these results, what is sad is to see European brand emerging from a specific country in Europe and being more focused now about going straight to the US or even trying to crack the Europe. I mean, Cezanne was, is kind of an exception uh, uh, of this as they really managed to scale across Europe and have to go to the US. But now there's a real strategic decision to make as am I going to try to crack every 27 countries or straight go to the US with a differentiated approach. And uh, actually, we see, and the problem before is that the venture capital, the European firm in the venture capital were a bit reluctant to say, go straight to the US because of the risk and so on. And Europe is closer, easier to manage, logistic and so on. But now there's a really emerging trend of going straight, thinking straight about the US. For sure, yeah. Um, I am personally, incredibly bullish on Europe and building brands yeah. out of here. So I'm hoping to see a lot come out from here. Um, we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you to Slush. And uh, see you at the, uh, I guess, after party. <laughs> Thanks, Dr.